All right, so we're going to get started today with exercise 207. And uh, basically today we're going to work in V-Ray again. So like I was saying, how we have a couple days in Rhino, then we go back to V-Ray, a couple more days in Rhino, back to V-Ray. Um, today's a V-Ray day. And we're going to talk today about a concept called texture mapping. And you guys have already experienced this a little bit because you put a texture on your house and realized that the brick was gigantic and it didn't look right. And so a large part of making our renderings look good in V-Ray is about how the texture is applied to an object so that it feels like it's the right scale and it looks correct. Um, we're going to talk through how do you make that happen today um, in, our, in our lab exercise 207. I have a file at the, if you go to exercise 207 today and you scroll to the bottom, there's an exercise 208 base file for test rendering. Um, this, even though it says 208, I put it on today's exercise because it's useful for the stuff we're doing today. Um, so it might be useful to go ahead and download it because it already has an infinite plane, it already has a sun, it already has basically the environment set up for you to do some, some renderings. Um, it's not required, but it'll help you out a little bit and save you some time. So it is there. Um, if you right click on it and say save link as, it will download and save that file for you, in which case you can go ahead and open it up by clicking on it and it will open up in Rhino. Alternatively, you could create an infinite plane, create a basic directional light and go from there. Um, I'm just trying to save you a little bit of steps because you've already done that a number of times. Um, this is the file, the exercise 208 base file for test rendering. It's available here. The environment layer has an infinite plane and a sun already installed on it. It's an actual sun, which is something we haven't done yet instead of directional light. Don't worry about that. We'll cover that a little bit later on. Uh, but it'll help your renderings look a little bit better. Um, so that's there. It's all locked, so we can't do anything to it, uh, which means we can't actually select it or, or anything. So that's, that's good. That's the way we want it to be. So in part one, to explore the concept of texture mapping, we're going to use a bunch of basic objects so that we can kind of see how these materials apply on an object. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you to create a variety of things, a cube, a sphere, a circle, a cone, a pyramid, and a wall-shaped rectangle. Uh, the idea of these objects is there should be roughly four feet by four feet-ish. Uh, the wall, however, um, I'd like the wall to be at the back, and I want it to be uh, 12 feet long. So there's at 12 feet, comma, uh, one foot. And we'll make it uh, eight feet high, something like that. So that is wall-shaped because that's one of the things that you will be creating a fair amount of this semester, so understanding how to apply texture to a wall is important. Um, so our, our cube here, uh, I'll do at four feet, comma, four feet, and we'll make it four feet tall. There's that. My sphere, I'm going to use my standard primitives here. I'll pick the standard sphere. My diameter is going to be four feet. It's below the ground plane, so I need to move it up. I can do that in either the front or the right side view. Those are the easiest places to do it. And I could simply drag it up to be above the ground plane. I'm not overly worried if it intersects with the ground plane, that's fine. If it floats a little bit above the ground plane, that's fine. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter for our purposes today. So I have my box, I have my sphere, I have my wall. What else did I say? A pyramid and a cone. Um, oh, it says circle, it should be cylinder. It's a mistake. Let me go into cylinder. My diameter would be four feet. And I'll do my height a little bit taller. We'll do an eight foot one. A cone. Same thing, my diameter at four feet. And we'll do my height at four feet there. And what do we have left? A pyramid. Pyramid, number of sides, I'm going to switch it back to four. Like that, ish. If any of these objects are too close together, it's fine. You can move them around. We're actually going to be dealing with these objects kind of one at a time anyway. Um, and so I'm going to start first with the cube itself. and. To get rid of the rest of the objects, I'm going to use the hide command. So I'm going to hold down shift and select all the rest of the objects there. I could put them on different layers. 
that would work. But for our purposes, I'm going to go ahead and just hide them. So I've selected the objects by holding down the Shift key. And I'll type hide and then enter. And that makes those objects go away. To bring them back, it's just show. And they come back. So once again, I'll hold down Shift and I'll select those four and type hide followed by the Enter key. And they're all gone except for this one cube. So I'm going to start working with the cube first. And I want to apply a texture to it that is a very distinct pattern so that you get used to what we're seeing. And so I would pick something like brick or some kind of wood planks or some kind of siding or something along those lines so that it's really kind of easy to see. Um, so I'll go ahead and go up to my uh, V-Ray. Oh, you know what? Let me load the V-Ray toolbars um, for our purposes today. It just makes life a little easier. I'll go to Tools, Toolbar Layout, and then File, Open. I have the V-Ray toolbar saved on my flash drive in my Resources folder. There they are. And we'll go ahead and load those in. And then I can click on my V-Ray Material Editor right here. It's the M button. And I'm going to click on Scene Materials. I'll right click and say Load Material. And I already have downloaded all the V-Ray tools, or all the V-Ray materials from our little uh, materials library. If you don't have that yet, I would download it again. Uh, if you do have it, it should be on your flash drive by now. We'll go into my Resources folder, which is where my V-Ray materials are. I'll go into V-Ray, and then V-Ray materials. And then this is just a matter of picking a, a, a pattern that's going to repeat. Uh, I've done it before with under siding. I've done it with the um, rough wood staggered. I think this one works pretty well. You can see it there. And so I'll go ahead and I'll right click on it and I'll say apply material to selection. Now nothing shows up just yet because I'm not in a rendered preview mode. And so I'd like to actually see this because then we'll be able to see what the texture mapping looks like as opposed to just relying on actually rendering. So if I were to actually render, we could render this out, and we'd see, OK, there's the material on my object. That takes too long. So instead, we're going to go into my preview mode. So I'll come up to the little triangle next to where it says perspective. I'll come down to my uh, rendered mode. And that will allow us to see what this looks like and what the texture mapping looks like. Uh, because of the lighting in the scene, one side of the, the cube is totally black. We're going to ignore that side and focus on the side that we can see rather easily there. That's not in the shadows. So if I look at this right now, it doesn't have any texture mapping applied. It doesn't look too bad, actually. But we can see that, OK, the planks seem reasonable up the side, but the planks on the top are definitely bigger. Uh, but the two planks on either side seem reasonable. So when I perform texture mapping on this, I'm going to select the object, and I'm going to come over to my Properties window, which is right here. By the way, obviously, I'm going to do this many, many times today. So if you get a little lost in the initial run through, don't worry about it. Uh, when I click on Properties with the object selected, we've done the basic object properties before. However, if we get to the Material Properties, if I click on that, we can see that, yes, this is the material that's assigned. And it has some textures assigned to it. That's fine. But one more past that is called texture mapping. It looks like kind of a orange and white checkerboard on a curdling cylinder there. And when I click on that, I get this set of tools. These are all the presets for texture mapping. And we'll go through what these various options are. But generally speaking, we want to pick a texture mapping that most closely resembles the shape that we're mapping. And so right now, we have a cube. And so lo and behold, there's a cube or a box. That's a great way of starting our mapping. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that Apply Box Mapping to this shape. And when I do that, absolutely nothing happens. That's because they're still asking for more information in my command line. So right up here, it says first corner of base, or do you want to just pick the bounding box? And I think the bounding box is usually the easiest method. It's essentially make a box around my entire object and apply it that way. So I'll go ahead and click on bounding box. Uh, the default world coordinate system is just fine. And do I want it to be capped? Do I want to be concerned with the top of this? In this case, yes, I do. So we'll click Yes. And notice that as soon as I do that, all of the textures are even on all the sides. They now look like they're part of the same scale. And so just by doing that, we've already taken a big step in the right direction. 
Now, as soon as I have the texture mapping applied on the object, notice I still have my object selected. I suddenly have a lot more options available here in the texture mapping. So a couple things. One, under the XYZ size, you'll see that it's 48, 48, 48. That's my bounding box size, which also happens to be my, my cube size at 4 feet, 4 feet, and 4 feet. So that's fine. That's telling it to apply the texture evenly on all the sides. We'll get to where those don't necessarily match. Now, the texture here came from a photograph. And if I zoom in at it, it has a certain size to it. So we could argue that these are maybe 2 by 6 boards, in which case two of these together would be about a foot. And so I have way more than I really need in this. So I can adjust that by changing this UVW repeat value. And I can adjust it separately in the x, y, and z directions. But generally speaking, you're going to want to lock all of them together and change it as a group. It's kind of like scaling everything at once. So in this scenario, maybe I'll change this from 1 to be 0.5. And when I change to 0.5, I now have 1, 2, 3 repetitions. Eh, it's not quite what I wanted. So maybe instead of 0.5, I might do 0.75. And now I get 1, 2, 3, 4, and a half. And yeah, not quite right. So it's somewhere in between 0.5 and 0.75. How about 0.66? There we go. 1, 2, 3, and 4. So scale-wise, it now feels about right. And so it's important to think about what the material is and what the scale should be in this. And we're going to adjust that using this UVW repeat value. So once that scale's set up, you can see that we have it on all sides. Nothing is squished when we're looking at it. It all seems reasonable there. And so we can zoom back a little bit, and we can perform a true test render. Because remember, the preview never is perfect. So we'll perform a test render and take a look at it, what it looks like. in its full-size version. So that looks pretty good. Looks reasonable. So at this point, I'm happy with it. Let's take a look at that wall-shaped object. So I'm going to type show again so that all my objects show back up. And I'm going to be working on this wall-shaped object instead. So let me hold down Control uh, and select the rest of these, or excuse me, Shift, and select the rest of these objects. And we'll hide those. And I'm going to work with this wall now. I could use the same material. I'm going to use brick because I think it'll show up a little bit better. I'm going to go into my V-Ray materials here. I'm going to go ahead and right click and say load material. I'm going to go into brick. And I'll do the standard red brick here. And let me apply this material to the selection. So now it has the brick applied to it. So. Obviously, this is significantly too big to begin with. So we need to make some adjustments. So same strategy applies here. We're going to apply a texture map to it. But this isn't a square. It's not a cube anymore. It's not even on all sides. But it is still kind of like a box. It's roughly like a box. So we're going to go ahead and use the box mapping on it right now. So we'll apply the box mapping on it. And we'll again use bounding box. We'll use world. And we'll go ahead and cap it, yes. And so you see when we do that, that this scale going up this way stayed consistent. But see, on the end, it squished the bricks. That's less than ideal. Likewise, it squished the bricks there. So we want to be able to apply this so that that doesn't happen. And obviously, the bricks are way too large for what we're trying to do. So we're going to come over here, and we're going to look at our options relating to this texture map. So right down here, we got. Um, 144 by 12 by 96. Those are the dimensions of our bounding box, which match up to the dimensions of our wall. If, however, instead of keeping these even, I go to x equals y equals z, it's going to distribute to the average all of those values. And when it does that, suddenly everything becomes a lot more even, and I lose the squishes. It still may need some adjustment. So in this case, I'll come down to my UVW repeat. I'll click on the lock button. 
and then I need to think about how many courses of these would be appropriate. I'm not actually going to count courses uh, and do math. I'm just going to take a look at visually what seems right. Uh, so in this case, last time, remember, we decreased the value. So we went to like 0.5 to make it bigger. Well, I don't want the bricks to get bigger. I want the bricks to get smaller. So this time, I'm going to increase the value. So maybe I'll go to like 4. All right, that starts to feel a little bit better, a little bit more like what the brick wall should be. And again, it's arbitrary. It's dependent on the size, but that feels about right. If we looked at one of the walls outside, yeah, that seems roughly about the right scale. The nice thing about texture mapping is it's not it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to visually look about right. So if I did 4 versus uh, 3.8, yeah, 3.8 would be fine. You know, if I did 3.8 versus 2, yeah, well, now it doesn't feel quite so right. So again, it's just about getting it close. So I'll go back up to 4, and there it is. So now that I've done this, we'll go ahead and do a test rendering of it as well. Notice that the pattern repeats going up the face, and then it changes when it gets to the top. Yeah? When you unlock that DPW, um, are you just adjusting the scale of each side individually? Correct. Okay. Correct. So if I unlocked this, and I switched, say, this one to 2, it's going to scale just the up and down. So I could, if I didn't like my pattern, for example, I could go up to 8, and it would squish it this way without squishing the other directions. So we can make them independent of each other. Though generally speaking, that, uh, keeping them consistent and locked is a good pr habit to be in, unless you have a very specific material that you want to change. So now that I've set that up correctly, and I like the end, we can go ahead and do a test rendering of this one and kind of take a look. Remember, we always end this by doing a, a real test rendering to make sure that, it, yes, it does look the way we want it to look. And so I can tell that, yeah, it's looking the way I want it to look. So I'm happy with that texture map so far. So we'll go ahead and come back, and we'll hide this one. And then we'll show everything. There we go. And let's hide everything but the cylinder this time. So I'll hold down Shift, and we'll hide. And now we have just the cylinder left. So once again, I want to apply a material to this cylinder. So I'll go to my V-Ray materials, and I'll right-click on the material and say Apply Material to Selection. I could, of course, apply it to the layer as a whole. And it's not awful when it first comes in. It's actually OK. But we can get a little bit more accurate with our texture mapping. So I'll come over to my texture mapping, and I will choose, instead of the box map, which I could do, I'm going to instead choose the cylindrical map, which is right over here. So we'll click Cylindrical Map, Base of Cylinder, um, or there's bounding box. We use bounding box, world, and we'll go ahead and cap it. And there is our cylinder. The cylinder tops love to be a little bit quirky. And you can see that the preview of this is turning out a little goofy. So let's concentrate on the sides first. So once again, we have 48, 48, and 96. If we do x equals y equals z, it will equalize those, but it'll mess things up. So just because every time I on the box I said equalize, on this one, I might not. Like that. So instead here, I might leave them at 48, 48, and 96, but I still might adjust the scale. So I'll come down to UVW repeat, and maybe I'll increase the scale to 4.0. And now we can see them. And that looks pretty good on the cylinder itself. So the top and the bottom are always a little bit tricky. And I think for me personally, what I tend to do on a cylinder is I tend to apply the top and the bottom as different texture maps rather than the same texture map. So I would take this object, I would explode it, I would take the top cylinder here, and instead of relying on the cylindrical mapping, I would delete it, and then I'd come back with either a surface mapping or a planar mapping, which I'll come back to. Uh, but if I did a surface mapping, for example, I can then come down and adjust the scale to 4, and it's going to maintain a nice straight map for me. 
Maybe that scale was a little bit different, so maybe it needs to be more of a 2, 2.5. That's about right, like that. So I end up breaking it apart and texture mapping the top separate from the sides. And I think you'll end up with better results in that scenario. So let me see if I can um, show you what happens. I'm going to back up a couple steps here. We'll go back to my cylinder. And this time, I'm going to change the material so that hopefully you can see this a little bit better. What would be a good material to see this happen on? No, I'll show it to you on the sphere. That'll be easier. So we'll leave this one. I'm going to go ahead and hide all show. And let's work on the sphere itself. I'll hold down Shift, hide the rest of the objects. And that leaves me with the sphere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could not choose the cap option, or you could delete the surface on the top, okay. and that would make it go away. So let's take a look at this sphere. I'm going to zoom selected, and when I zoom selected on this, I'm going to then apply a material. So let me right click and say, um, sorry, let me click on the material editor. I'll right click. I'm going to use the planks for this one. Apply material to selection, and there they are. It's actually not too bad by default. But let me show you some of the differences in how these projections work now. So now that we've gotten through some of the different texture mappings, let me show you on a sphere why certain projections work. So the box mapping, if I were to apply a box mapping, well, essentially what it does is it projects the texture in three directions. So we have top, front, and right side as applications of texture. If I did it to the sphere, however, We can see, so here it is coming down from the top. See right in this area where I've got kind of a confusion between the two different textures? Can you guys see that on the screen okay? Let's see if maybe that one's a little bit easier to see. Yeah, right there. See that problem? That's one of the corners. So up here, it's projecting straight down with the texture. From the, here, it's projecting this way. And from this side, it's projecting that way. And so when we get to that corner, it gets awkward. And so it ends up with a weird result. If I were to actually render this out in its full rendered v view, kind of like the preview, we get a really awkward part in the corner where the textures just don't match right. I'm hoping to get it through that corner so you can see it. Yeah, exactly. So there you can see it a little bit better. They just don't quite mesh. So instead of doing that, we would, let me delete this mapping, we would apply one that's more closely related to this particular object. Could we do a cylindrical mapping? Yeah, that would work. But we do have a spherical mapping. So we could click on spherical mapping with a bounding box world, and now it's mapped on it. And at this place, we are already x equals y equals z. It's already there, so there's nothing we can change. But we could change the scale uh, to be like more dense, for example, et cetera. Now, as we look at the top here, the wood is obviously getting squished. It's kind of like a globe. When you have a, a curvature in two directions, it's going to get squished at the top or the bottom. And so it's, it's worth just being aware that that kind of stuff does tend to happen. Now, if I wanted this to be a globe, for example, and I made a material that was stretched at the top and the bottom. Let's say I took one of those maps where Canada is, is stretched. You know what I'm talking about, right? If I took one of those images where it's stretched at the top and the bottom, and I were to apply that as a material, when it went around the globe, it would look correct. So you could actually texture map something like this with a different style texture and get good results. So it's just dependent on the material itself. We will talk a lot more about materials later and how you, how you build out these materials. So we'll come back to that. So this has a cylindrical mapping on it. It seems fairly reasonable. So I'm pretty happy with it. So at this point, I will go ahead and show all of my objects again. And I'm getting, you see how I'm working my way up into the more complicated objects. I will come back to some of these objects in a little bit. Let me take these, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, hide them. And I'm back to the cone. So this one presents a challenge because it's not really like any of the primitives just yet. 
So when I apply texture mapping to this, well, obviously, first thing we need is some materials on it. So let me apply the brick to it. So I've applied the brick to it, and it doesn't look very good. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm still going to use one of the primitives, but I have to think about which one is kind of close to what I want. I'm thinking maybe cylindrical would look OK. So I'll go ahead and apply the cylindrical mapping. Again, bounding box, world, uh, and capping it doesn't matter because there isn't really a cap on it. So we'll go ahead and hit Enter, and there it is. So it gets, it's OK until we start to get to the upper part where we get some weird kind of jagged seams. So that's not necessarily the best. Let me delete that. We could apply a spherical map to it. And again, we'll bounding box, world. And OK, it's not too bad. It's reasonable, but it's a lot bigger at the bottom than it is at the top. And even if I adjusted the scale, it still appears to get smaller when we get toward the top. So that one's not the best. So we'll go ahead and delete that one. Now, depending on where you're rendering it, something like this might actually work OK using a box, even though it's counterintuitive. So if we applied our box mapping to it, world, um, sorry, I should have left it uncapped. Depending on where we're rendering, no, it's still giving me bad seams right there. Sometimes you can get it to where you're not going to get a bad seam. It just depends on the angle for reference. OK, so none of those worked particularly well, which was kind of part of my point here. Uh, so instead, we're going to apply a custom map to it. I'm going to use the Unwrap right here button. And so I'll go ahead and click on Unwrap. And it says, Select Seams. So we'll create a seam down at the bottom here. And I don't have a seam going up the side, so we're just going to go with it. And I'll go, go ahead and press Enter. And when that happens, it's creating a custom map. I would like to see what that custom map looks like, so I'll use this UV editor. I will do this twice, so don't panic just yet. I'll use my UV editor, which will allow me to draw a box here that will show me the unwrapped pieces of my cylinder. So this is the piece that was, was stretched. This is the bottom of the, of the piece that was stretched. I can then start to adjust the texture mapping on these two pieces. I think doing the cone first was a mistake because it's too confusing. So I'm going to jump over and do the pyramid, and I'll come back to the cone, OK? Because it'll help to see more seams and how it comes together. So let me back up here, and let me switch. Uh, Let me start with this when we get to the custom map. So I'm going to go back to my um, materials here. I'm going to apply my bricks. There we go. And so I'm going to come in to do the unwrap tool here. So select seams. This is as if it's like in one, what is it, 130 when you guys make those little shapes and they're folded out flat and then you cut them out and put them together. Do you guys remember doing that? as part of your drafting constructions. Same thing here. We're going to choose where the seams should be. So I'm going to come down one side, and I'm going to work my way around my object. There, 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 and there. That gives me seams around my object. I'll go ahead and press Enter. Then I'm going to come over to this UV editor, this one here. And when I do the UV editor, I'm going to draw a big box over here. And it's going to show me the bottom and all four of the sides as if they were unrolled. For the time being, I'm going to turn off my environment so that I can see this a little bit better uh, right here. Then I can switch back to my, um, my texture mapping. And so in order to see this a little bit better in my UV editor, oops. Sorry, I went. There we go. So the UV editor is right here. 
and it's hard to kind of tell. So I've got my unwrapped pieces, but I'd like to have the, the actual texture down below so I can see how it's going to apply a little bit. Um, let me switch into, oh, I'm already in render mode. Okay, that works. I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to use a texture instead. So I've clicked on this Use Texture, and I'm going to add a texture. And they have actually just like a checkerboard pattern like this. And I could say OK to help you kind of visualize it. But I would like to go find the actual texture. And so I'm going to use a bitmap texture. I'm going to go to my flash drive, into my resources, into V-Ray, into V-Ray materials. I'm going to go into that brick folder. I'm going to go to the red standard brick. And I'm going to pick this colored image. And when I do that, like that, and say OK, it's going to re replace that background here with my brick. Now, as I manipulate these objects and or scale these objects, it's going to manipulate how it's appearing on this particular object here. So if, for example, I were to take this, let me move it there, and let me rotate it. So that this object, say, started with a brick, this side here is like that side there. So if I were to scale this object, let me scale these two together here. And actually, since I'm here, let me go ahead and move. Let me turn on my object snaps. And it's doing a great job of not letting me select things. There we go. Let me move just this one here. This is the bottom. It doesn't really matter, but I'd like these two to be together. And this should really be rotated. That. There we go. I'm going to take those. I'm going to scale them. And so let's say that I really wanted this to be more like that. Now you can see the reflecting pattern. But you can also see that because I unwrapped it, that the brick pattern flows from this seam down around the bricks on those sides. There is always going to be an awkward seam. So in that case, this is the awkward side because of how it comes together. But the other sides of this will flow around the corners of that seem there. Does that kind of make sense? So this is a very challenging way of really customizing a texture. If we can get away with the primitives, you can see how much easier it is to work with the primitives than doing any of the kind of this custom mapping. So to the extent that we can stick with the primitives, life is a lot better. Cylinders, spheres, and box will get you almost all the objects that you need without too much trouble. When we get into these other kinds of objects, it gets a little bit trickier. And so the same things would apply to the cone that I did earlier, where we could do the same kind of unwrap. It's a lot harder to see, though, because of how these are applied together. Uh, but the point is that this texture then can wrap around that kind of an object. So if you had a special custom tweaked object like that where you wanted the texture to look a certain way, you could actually create it. So let's go back and revisit some of the other textures for a second. So I'm going to go ahead and apply that texture. I'm going to show the rest of my objects. Apparently. Did I accidentally delete them? There we go. Uh, let me go back to the box for just a second. So I'm going to hold down Shift, select everything but the box, hide. We're going to zoom in on just the box. So this box also has another way of representing the texture map. So right now, as we look at it, let's say that instead of having these planks run horizontal, I wanted those planks to be running vertically. Okay. So in that scenario, I could come down here to the UVW rotate, and it's probably this last one, but you'd have to, to try around. I could switch to 90, and those would be rotating. Uh, and standing up that way, and it would flow across there rather than around here. 
But sometimes it's much more difficult to actually figure out which one of these does the rotation. In that case, it didn't work at all. Uh, and so instead of doing that, there's another tool that's available to us as part of texture mapping that's called show mapping. And it's right here. And when I click on that, it will create this dotted line object that represents the mapping. Not the object, the mapping on the object. And I can then start to manipulate this object, this dotted line object, and control how the texture is applied. So in this scenario, if I wanted to, to rotate this, I could simply type rotate. Uh, it would actually be a rotate 3D. And I could say, OK, let's take this as my axis. And let me rotate this like that. And suddenly, I've rotated how this is being applied. So I took the top and put it on the bottom. This is one scenario where there's another tool that's available in Rhino that I'm going to tell you about right now uh, that I think works particularly well. Some people like this tool so much that they leave it on all the time. I don't like this tool that much, and so I won't use it most of the time. And for those of you that have, that have taken Rhino, you know how I feel about this. It's called the gumball. And it works by giving you this little blue, red, and uh, green object. And this allows us to easily manipulate an object, easily rotate and manipulate a particular object. Um, to me, it's a very imprecise way of working in Rhino. I would rather use move and snaps, etc. However, this is convenient because you can just drag on any one of these and adjust the particular object. So if I wanted to rotate this, with the gumball selected, I can rotate in just this red direction by clicking on the red arc here and rotating the gumball. Now, I can also see a live preview of what's happening. So I could, I could have this rotated such that it was on a 45 there. I could, let me snap back. Let me just undo. But I could also rotate, if I wanted this, say the top there to be on a 45, like that, and the sides to wrap around. So you have a lot of flexibility. If I wasn't happy with where the texture was uh, applying, I can actually move the texture itself over. Now, if I went from right here all the way to right here, it would look exactly the same because the texture is just repeating once. But I could create a different seam if I wanted to by just moving that object. So let's take a look. I'm going to go ahead and hide that map. Let's take a look at one of the other objects. So let me hide this. Let me show. Uh, and I'm going to keep the wall up for a second. Let me hold down Shift, select the rest of my objects, and type Hide. And let's look at the wall. I'll turn off the gumball temporarily. And now with the wall selected, I'll go ahead and click on Show Mapping. And so here, this is a little bit different. So the box that represents my mapping isn't the same size as the wall anymore. It's different. So in this scenario, if I wanted to adjust it, I could turn back on the gumball. And I could move where the brick pattern was, was appearing. I could rotate the brick pattern if I wanted to. Uh, let me see which one would be more useful. I'm not sure why you'd have diagonal bricks, but I could do that if I wanted to. But I could also scale this. So let's say that these bricks just looked a little skewed to me. They, they, I wanted them to be longer, like these bricks that are outside here. I can do a scale on this object. So I'm going to click and hold on this red box at the end here. And I'm going to scale and make that a little bit bigger just in this direction. So depending on what the scale is that I wanted, I could adjust it there. I could adjust it on the end if I wanted to by dragging this green. And that would adjust the scale of the bricks on the end. Do you guys get how that's working? So sometimes it's easier to actually manipulate the texture by visually manipulating the texture mapping than it is to go over here and adjust the values of the UVW repeats. So sometimes that's a really useful strategy. So let's leave that there for a second. Um, I'm going to go ahead. You have to have the object selected when you click on Hide Mapping to make it go away. There it is, Hide Mapping. I'm going to turn off my gumball. I'm going to show all of my objects. Let me 
And let's see here. There we go. I'm going to select everything but the sphere now. And I'll hide. And so the sphere here, we might want to apply. Uh, and this is where I think it's particularly useful. Let me show the mapping. It's again a sphere. I'll come back into my um, gumball. And in this scenario, if I wanted the, the texture just to be shifted, I can do that relatively easily. And it's, it seems more prevalent somehow on a ball to see how it, how it starts to adjust. So you can play around with that. You can adjust your various settings uh, to get that. So the whole first part of today's exercise, part one, is playing around with these texture mappings and starting to have a good understanding of what's, what's involved, how do you manu maneuver your objects, how do you manipulate them, et cetera. So I would encourage you to use a, a strong pattern like these planks or brick or something so you can really see what's happening. Um, when you're done with all of them, uh, do a render of all of them. So I would go back and show, there they all are, get a nice little view here, and then go ahead and render it so that you get your full rendered version of it. And now we're going to move into some of the objects that we created before and go back to dealing with the texture mapping. So this one's done, and I'll let that render in the background. In the meantime, I'm going to open up that bridge that we worked on. Remember two classes ago? I'm going to open that one up. It was on my flash drive, not in the resources folder. And there it is. Um, this one is already finished, already has materials and stuff applied to it. Uh, let me see if I have one that isn't finished just yet. I was hoping for one with the infinite plane and stuff. Um, yeah, OK, this one's not finished, so that's fine. OK, so I've gone back and I've opened up. I've now moved into part three of the handout for today. I went ahead and I opened up the bridge from that, that class. Before I start to use this, we're going to use this as a block. We're going to bring it in as a referenced object uh, into a final scene to do some rendering on it. Um, and so before I do that, I want to clean this up. So most of you probably had an infinite plane and a directional light that were part of this. Go ahead and take those and delete them because we won't need them. They we don't need them to come in when we, when we um, do this rendering. All we need is the bridge itself. Go ahead and take the bridge itself and move it so that there's a nice, let me turn on my object snap again here. I'm going to pick this corner right here, and I'm going to put that at 0, 0, 0. So that it's right at the origin. That'll help me when I bring it in as a block. Then I'll go ahead and organize my layers a little bit. So let's come in here, and instead of being called default, I'll call this bridge. There it is. And we'll go ahead and assign a material to that object. So I'll come over um, up to my V-Ray materials. I'll go to V-Ray, Material Editor. I'm going to apply the, I think this was basic concrete, right? Yep. Apply material to selection. Actually, I'm going to apply it to the layer, and I'll put it on the bridge layer. I'm going to take the rest of these layers and delete them. So I selected the first, held down Shift, selected the last, and then pressed the Delete. Okay, so all I have is the bridge layer, no other objects, just the object that I want to bring in. I'm going to look at this in rendered mode. So I'll switch into rendered mode. Oh, looks like my material didn't load correctly. Give me a second to fix that. I'm going to go to V-Ray, Material Editor. And let me go ahead and import material. This, I'm just overriding the existing material because it didn't load correctly. Resources, V-Ray, V-Ray materials, concrete, concrete basic. There it is. All right. And then I want to apply my texture mapping. So we just did texture mapping. I'm going to do the same thing. This is roughly a box, so it's a good one to apply. I'll go ahead and come to my properties. I'll go to my texture mapping. 
I'm going to apply a box. It'll be a bounding box. World. Go ahead and cap it. And then I'll adjust the scale. So probably needs to be a little bit smaller. Maybe let's try two. And maybe a little bit smaller than that. Let's try three. And that feels about right for my material. So I have that set up correctly. I'm happy with it. I'll go ahead and save this. So I'm going to go to File and then Save As. And I'll put it into today's folder. And let me go with a new folder for today. This is spring of 2019. And I'll go ahead and click Save. So that's ready. It has the material applied to it. I'm going to go ahead and open up in a separate Rhino. Notice that each time I'm actually minimizing Rhino instead of closing Rhino. So I'm going to minimize it. I'll come back to the desktop. I'll open Rhino again. This allows me to keep multiple versions of Rhino open at once. So open that back up. I'll go into open. And I'll go to last week's class. And I'll open up this object to remember. Same thing, I'm going to come in and I'm going to rename my layers. So I'll have a layer for glass. You may have already done this. I'll call this glass. I'll right click and say change object layer. I'll select the spider clamp. Change object layer. Let's call this one spider clamp. And I'm going to take both of those and I'm going to put them as a sublayer. And I'll rename the sublayer or the master layer to be a glass wall or curtain wall for organization purposes. So before I bring anything in as a block, I want to make sure I clean it and change my layers and make it nice and neat. So I don't want extra layers. So I have curtain wall, I have glass. Oops, looks like I spelled that wrong. I'll get rid of these extra layers. So layer three to layer five, I'll hold down shift, select them, and press delete. It leaves me with just my glass and my spider wall, or my uh, spider clamp. I'll go into my uh, V-Ray materials. So V-Ray material editor. I'll right click and say load material. And I need materials for the, the clamp and for the glass itself. Um, let me go into my flash drive. And I've, a lot of people had luck with the steel material. So we'll go ahead and use that one. I'm going to go into metal. I'm going to go into steel. And I'm going to pick dark steel. And I'll say open. I'll take dark steel. I'm going to apply material to layer. And this would be the spider clamp. So everything on that layer is applied with the steel. This is my glass. I'm going to create my glass. So I'll go ahead and create material standard because real glass won't render that well. Um, and so we'll call this glass. I'll change my color, be kind of a bluish color, maybe like that. I'll change my transparency to be dark gray. And it looks about like that. And we'll go ahead and apply material to um, layer. And we'll put that on the glass layer itself. So I have the material applied. Now, when it comes to texture mapping this object, right? I have a variety of objects here to do my texture mapping. And you're going, oh no, this is going to be a pain. Which is right, it would be. However, the material that I have applied, the steel material, I'm not going to be able to see any seams because it's just kind of a metal material. It'd be kind of like white painted. I'm not going to see anything. So because I don't have anything special applied to it with no repetition of pattern, I'm not going to do the texture mapping on it. So I just saved you a bunch of time. So depending on what it is that you're making, you may or may not need to actually adjust the texture mapping. So in this scenario, even if I switched into render mode, you can see that there's just not a whole lot I can do to either one of these from a texture mapping standpoint. So I don't have to worry about it. So at this point, I'll go up to File and then Save As. And we'll put it into today's folder. And we'll call this Curtain Wall. And I'll go ahead and save. And there it is. So I've prepped both of these files. Again, no infinite plane, no lights of any kind, just a master layer and some sub layers. That's it. 
Now time to bring them into a scene to perform my rendering. So remember way back at the beginning of today, I downloaded this exercise 208 base file for rendering. I'm going to use that same file again. We'll just open it one more time. Oh, hold on. Let me not open the file. I need. I thought I had saved this already. So let me take this one and do a save as. Let me try opening that one again. All right, so this is now here. Now remember, I already have an infant plane here. I already have a, a sun installed, so my renderings are ready to go here. So this is where I'll do the renderings. All I have to do is bring my object in, and I'm going to do that as a block. I'll go up to the Edit menu, I'll go to Blocks, and I'll say Insert Block Instance. I can also press Control-I or type Insert on the keyboard. That brings up the Insert um, dialog box here. I'm going to browse for my file. So it was in today's folder, so we'll go there. I'll start with the bridge. I'll go ahead and say Open. We see it here. I'm going to bring it in as a block instance. That's what I want. If you've worked in AutoCAD before, block instances, yes, AutoCAD has block instances, but uh, Rhino treats block instances kind of like they do XREFs in AutoCAD. So they're a little bit different than a true block reference in AutoCAD. So we're going to do uh, a block instance here. I'm going to go ahead and say OK. It's going to give me some options, the insert file options. The name, that's fine. Right here, I have block definition type. I have embed, embed and link, and link. So these are different, different strategies. Embed is essentially take my file and stick it in. So it's permanently inside of my, my file. Now, if for right now, sure, I could do that. If, however, I had a really complicated file with lots of work in it, it would be far better not to embed it because it's going to make the file too big, instead to just reference it, to link it. And so this last option here, link, is the one that I want you to get used to using. The only caveat here is you have to keep your original file. So I still need my exercise 205 bridge file that's in my folder. And I can't move it, or I'm going to have to find it again. So I need that file. It's the, way, it's the same way InDesign works, where we have to have those reference files. And when it goes to get the geometry, it'll go to that file, get the geometry, and bring it in. This tends to speed up Rhino quite a bit if you get used to working that way. It also has some advantages such that if you wanted to change the material or the geometry of this particular shape, you can go back and edit the file and then it will update itself later on. I don't recommend the embed and link. I'm always in either embed it and commit to it or just link it. And I would prefer the link if you're working on it. The other thing under layer style is I prefer to have it set as reference, which is what the default is. Um, reference will show up in our layer palette a little bit differently, and it will help you not get confused down ro the road. So link and reference are what I'm recommending. Go ahead and say OK. And it's going to ask you where to put it. So at this point, I'll just stick it somewhere. We'll stick it there. If we look at my layers, we have the default layer, we have the environment layer, we have the default layer, and then we have this layer that's grayed out. This is now representative of that bridge file. And the nice thing here is it's grayed out, so I know it's a block, but I still have access to manipulate the materials if I wanted to or if I needed to. I would rather edit the original block file itself anyway. So there it is. It's a little bit too low, so I'm going to use my move command, move. But I want to move it vertically, so I click on vertical or type V for vertical. And we'll bring it up here in space a little bit so it's floating there. It is a bridge after all. Now at this point, I want lots of these. So I can go ahead and just copy it. I'll type copy or go up to the transform copy. I'll pick a point using my object snaps. And 
and we will come in here and we will copy a bunch of them together. to form my bridge. When I'm done, I'll press enter, and that leaves me with this bridge. So that's pretty good. If I were to switch into my rendered mode, we'd see that the material also came with it, which is quite convenient. Now, if I decided that I didn't like this material, for example, and I wanted to change that material, I could go back to the original file, which was right here, and I can change the material. So let me go back into my V-Ray Material Editor. Say, so you know what, instead of the basic concrete, I wanted a different concrete. Let me go ahead and load material. I'll go into concrete. I'm going to do the, um, let's do the vertical plywood with form, form ties. I'm picking that because it has a, a more of a pattern to it. Let me apply the material to layer. It's going to go on the bridge layer. There it is. The texture mapping, though, got too big. So I need to come back. I'm going to select all of the objects. I'm going to go back to my texture mapping, and I'm going to decrease the size here. Maybe 0. No, let's do it at 1.0. So in that scenario, we're seeing the seam there, and we're seeing the little form ties that are on the sides there. Uh, in reality, it's probably a little bit bigger than that, so maybe instead of doing it at 1, I do it at 1.5. I'm still seeing, oops, sorry, 0.75. Yeah, that'll work. I'll do it like that. I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'll go to File and then Save. Important, you save it. Then I'll go back to that file where I brought them all in, right here. And obviously nothing's changed just yet. If I go to the Edit menu and I go to Blocks, there's something called a Block Manager. You can also type in Block Manager. And when I look at that, it's going to say, here's your block. And guess what? The linked file is newer. Go ahead and update that linked file. And magically, everything that I did, everything that I changed, got updated in here. So if I went back to my geometry, so if I went back to here, and I said, you know what, let's, uh, let's add a piece of wood up on top of this geometry to make this railing a little bit bigger. Uh, I don't know. Let me scale this 1D. I'm not doing this because it's the most attractive thing in the world. I'm just trying to illustrate something, OK? So let me come in and change my V-Ray material. So let me go to my material editor. Let me right click on C materials. Let me load material. I'm going to load in some wood this time. Go to wood. Apply material to selection. Uh, so in this scenario, I really should create another layer as I do this. So let me go ahead and create another layer. We'll call this wood rail. And that would allow me to apply that material to the wood rail layer. There we go. I need to look at the texture mapping of that object. So there it is. I'm going to go in and go to my properties, go to my texture mapping. Go to Apply Box Map, Bounding Box, World, Capped. Then I need to x equals y equals z so that they're even. Uh, and then let's go ahead and check my scale here. Probably needs to be a little bit higher. So I'm starting to see it. Now, the grain on the top here isn't the way that I want it to be. So this would be a perfect opportunity to show the mapping use my gumball and rotate the mapping. Hold down shift so it jumps. And now the top and the sides are going the correct direction. Still, I think, needs to be a little bit more repetition, so maybe four. All right, it's starting to look nicely like a piece of wood. 
Okay, I'm happy with it like that. I'll select it and hide the mapping, turn off the gumball, and now I have that piece there. I can take this and just copy it, or better yet, let me mirror it so that it shows up on the other side. And there it is on the other side as well. So once I have these two, uh, oh, I should point out something else. So sometimes you create two objects and they don't, they're the same object, but they don't have the same uh, texture mapping applied to them. We can copy texture mapping from one object to another. So if you created it once and you like it, it's easy to copy it over. So if I select the object that I want to copy to, I can then click on this match mapping and it, it'll say select source object. I can copy the same mapping from there. So it saves time. Once you have one object the way you want, you can just copy it over to a second object. So I have both of those set up. I can go back to file and then save. Once it's saved, I can go back to my bridge file right here. I can go into my um, edit blocks block manager. I can select this linked file is newer. We can go ahead and click update. Sometimes this pops up, generally replace existing material and then apply all. And suddenly this, I now have those wooden pieces on top. So there's a distinct advantage when you're doing this because I can make modifications to that bridge and it will apply to all of the pieces rather than having to, to model separately. So you're just modeling a little piece of it and then continuing from there. So I have that established. I have it the way I want. Let's bring in that glass wall. I'll go into edit blocks, insert block instance. I'm going to browse for my curtain wall. Go ahead and say OK. Again, it's a link and a reference. OK. And we'll drop it in. It's not in the correct direction, so I need to do a rotate on it. There, so now it's going in the right direction. And in all reality, uh, it would be a bit annoying to have to build a wall out of these pieces if I were just using the copy command and coming in here and going one at a time like that. So instead of doing that, I'm going to use the array command, which will repeat the object multiple times. I'll type array, or I can go up. I think it's under transform. Might be under edit. Of course, I'm not going to be able to find it right now. Array, there we go. And so we're doing a rectangular array. Select objects to array. I'm going to pick my block. There it is. Um, I'll press enter when done. Number in the x direction. Okay, so number in the x direction is just going to be 1 because I'm not repeating going this way, so it's just 1. Number in the y direction, I don't know, 20. Number in the z direction, 10. Y spacing our first reference point. So this is where we need to determine what the y spacing is. So I'm going to snap right there to that corner, and you see that it starts to build out all of my objects. I know this spacing would be at four feet, but I can also snap to the end of the object like that. Then it says Z spacing. I know again that that would be six feet, but I could also snap this way and start to build out the wall that way. And we'll snap to the end. So if I did this correctly, I'd end up creating this whole wall of glass curtain in front of my object. You have to enter to accept because you have the opportunity to change these. So for example, I don't need 10 high. I could say that, you know what, I only really need about six high. And maybe I need a few more in the y direction. I could say, you know what, I want a few more in that direction. When I'm done, I'll go ahead and press Enter. And it then builds my whole object there. Let me take those objects. And let me move them a little bit closer to my bridge. It'll help the rendering a little bit. Let me move them back a little bit this way. And I'm going to set up my view for the actual render. So we'll zoom in on it, maybe about like that. So we're seeing the, the spider clamps in the background. And at that point, we can go ahead and perform our first render. So I'll go up to my standard toolbars here. We'll click on Render. 
and we can have a look at what it should look like. I do mention in the handout uh, using a cage edit. I'm going to skip the cage edit for today, and uh, so that's step eight. I'm going to skip that. You can do it if you want, but I'm going to skip it and do it a little bit later on in the semester. Uh, I forgot to edit that out of today's exercise. Um, so by the end of today, I'm expecting you to have a good understanding of texture mapping, and I'm ultimately expecting you to get this rendering out, where you have your bridge and or your glass wall behind it. Okay. So spend some time with texture mapping. Make sure you really understand that. If you have trouble, let me know. Um, but this is where you can actually start to create an object that looks good. I have an expectation for your assignment that you're working on or starting to work on now that you have good texture mapping. That's one of the criteria for the assignment is making sure that the texture mapping is in scale. Generally, the people that don't do as well on that assignment haven't addressed texture mapping. That tends to be the thing people forget. So make sure that you do uh, work on that and adjust that as you go forward. Are there any questions about this? I know it's a lot of information to take in, but it's a lot of things where you just need to practice. You need to play around with the objects and see what's happening. Yeah? So we're posting this photo and then the photo. This photo should be your featured image, and then do a rendering with all your objects in it, just to have proof that you, you played around with it. Remember, today's about experimentation and learning, so it doesn't have to look perfect. It's that you were able to experiment and learn uh, and get something out of the end result. All right?